Hey everyone, we're going to get started. I'm talking to the microphone just so that it's uh, for recording purposes. Not uh, because I don't think you guys can all hear me. But um, welcome. Thank you guys all for coming to our first candidate information session. I am Jessica Bailey, your Fort County Clerk. And I want to introduce our Director of um, Elections and Registration Sunday and then our Assistant Director and also the site or the site clicker <laughs> for the Peggy. <laughs> Um, you guys will be talking with them quite a bit. Uh, today, our session is going to focus on campaign finance and also signage. So we have Tina Taylor and Sarah Farr, who is going to uh, help us out with that. But again, if you guys have questions, we are recording this, so you will be able to talk with the microphone just so it doesn't look like um, <laughs> the presenters are talking to themselves and so everyone can hear what's said. But again, thank you for spending your Saturday with us, and we'll get started. Thank you. Uh, a little bit about my background. I started uh, been involved in politics for 43 years now. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Kenner Taylor is my name. Uh, the last 20 years of it has been really concentrated on campaign finance. One of the most misunderstood uh, subjects. We're going to go through some things today, and then I'm going to show you some examples. And the examples are from the last three years, some common mistakes and some mistakes you do not want to make, because you could be criminally charged with some of these things. And if anybody doesn't believe that campaign finance reports gets looked at, take a look at the what, what occurred over in the county next to us, and just what occurred north in Portage, where campaign finance became a prime issue in two federal trials. So it is very, very important, and it's very, very much reviewed now. Your opponents will review your campaign finance reports, and they will criticize you for it. I know I serve as book, I've served, I've served as a treasurer for 13 different committees currently. And a lot, a lot of the reason I do that is because if people have got themselves in trouble with campaign finance reform. And so they come in and look to me for help. But uh, so far, we've kept them out of trouble. I mean, I had one client that had a problem, supposedly, according to her campaign finance reports, she had $60,000 in her, in her bank account, cash on hand. You actually checked the bank account, it was $16,000. Well, where did the other $44,000 go? It was all errors made in the campaign finance report over a series of about three or four years, but nobody caught it until all of a sudden somebody questioned the campaign finance reports. And we went in and actually looked at the reports. I went in and looked at the reports. I found duplications on Donations, I found in kind donations that were accounted for as a donation but were not accounted for as an expense. And I found all of that money was just misfilling out of campaign finance reports. But there looked like on the surface there was something criminally going on. And it really wasn't. It was just the way the campaign finance reports were being done. So you've got to be very careful with what you do. Now, some of the first slides I'm going to go over are a little bit, uh, at this stage of the game, not going to be as valuable to you as, as the later one. But one of the things, how many of you are candidates? How many of you are your own treasurer? First mistake. Treasurer should not be the candidate. Your job is to get elected. And it's when you, what happens and what I find happens most is when a candidate is a treasurer, the last thing they think about is keeping accurate records for their campaign finance report. All of a sudden, come a November 11th, you're going to be saying, oh my God, i got to have that reported in the next week. I better go back and look at all the bills I paid and all the checks I wrote and all that stuff. So you should not be your own treasurer. So keep that in mind for the future. But in uh, next slide. 
How many of you are using your personal bank account for your campaign? Nobody. Good. That's another big mistake that candidates used to do. They used to run all their campaign funds through their personal checks. That's a big no-no with the IRS. So you've got to set up your own bank account and get an EIN number. And I would assume all of you know how to get the EIN number since you set up your own bank account. Banking laws require that. Next slide. The reporting period. The reporting period for this pre-election report ends on 10-11-19. The supplemental report, then you have to have the reporting by the 18th. Now, one of the other mistakes commonly found is somebody saying, well, I got, I fill out the report on the 17th, and I got some money in on the 14th. I'll go ahead and put that in the report. Ain't supposed to go in the report. Your books close officially on the 11th of October. That's the last thing you report on that report, both income and expenses. By the way, when do you receive income? Anybody know when you actually receive the income according to the law? Is it the date on the check? It's the date you deposit is the date you officially receive it. Not the date on the check. Because it is considered not received until the date you deposit it. Next slide. The CMA 4 has four Three parts to it. Top part is your committee information. The next part is finance information, which is where you're going to put your numbers in. And the last part is where the candidate and treasurer sign it. So let's look at that first part with the next slide. One of the things that I've seen happen too is you will form your committee in January. And then somebody will say, well, I want a different name for my committee. So you open up the bank account with a different name than the committee name. That top part is supposed to match your CFA 1. So whatever you filed on your CFA 1, that's the name of your committee for all of your reports. For all of your reports, that is the name of the committee. Next slide. Here. This is where you get your information. This is where you fill out your finance information. And what I've done on this is I've color coded where everything that you should put in there is and where it should come from. Every bit of information on that front page is gathered from your bank statement and the information that you fill out on the following pages. Okay? And th this shows where everything comes from, and we'll be going over each one of these. Another thing is, another area that gets misinterpreted by a lot of candidates, and I hate to spell out one party, but I'm going to do it, the Democrats. They hate to put down unitemized income. Okay? They'll put in, for an example, in, in Sheriff Reynolds and him and I have had many discussions over this. He will put down unitem uh, golf outing income as a title. That is not an itemized uh, thing. That money that he received from his golf outing that's less than hundred dollars from an individual, but he puts it in one lump sum as unitemized or as itemized as an individual. And that's totally misquoting what the law is. Okay? So, all right, I have helped his treasurer now. He doesn't do that anymore. Because <laughs> his treasurer and I work together on that. But that is a, and I don't, what is unitemized? Unitemized is any contribution or expenditure less than $100 from one individual or to one company. Okay, so if somebody gives you $25, you do not have to shoot detail that on your report. You do not have to detail that on the report. You can if you want to, 
in for some small races that's kind of okay. But what if you're running as a mayor and you have a report that's 75 pages long because you want to itemize every donation or every expenditure? And believe me, the Mayor Gary's report two years ago was 75 pages long because she wanted to show every income and expense. The reason I know is because I did the report. I could strangle her. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm just being she's a good gal. Uh, but that's what you can get into with these reports. So if it's under $100, you don't have to report it. If it's over $100, you have to report it. And you report it on the unitemized Income and unitemized expense. Yes, question. What if it's exactly $100? If it's exactly $100, you do not have to report it. It's over $100. If it's $100 and one cent, you have to report it. If it's $75 and it's over $100, you do not have to report it. Okay. Thank you. 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 Typically, well, only three. Checks, cash, in kind, and loans. Okay? Checks are checks you receive from people or are like that. It, cash. I highly recommend you minimize the amount of cash you receive in, from anybody. And if you receive over $100, we're going to cover this again. You write out a cash receipt so that you have accurate records of who gave you cash. Okay? The reason being is, let's say that you run a fundraiser, and the fundraiser is $75 for the primary. And somebody gives you $75 cash. Then you run another fundraiser for the fall. And this time it's $50. That same individual now gives you fifty dollars. What has happened? The individual is giving you one hundred and twenty-five dollars. You've got to report it. At that point, you have to report the donations. You didn't have to report it in the primary, but you have to report it in the fall because they went over one hundred dollars. That's where your cash receipts and keeping an accurate record will help you keep it. Keep track of those numbers so that you don't get yourself in trouble. Another area that is always misunderstood is in-time donation. If somebody, for an example, gives you t-shirts, David's got a t-shirt on over there, right? He's got a friend that's in the t-shirt business. He says, David, I'll print you up 25 t-shirts and give it to your campaign. That's considered an in-kind donation. There has to be a value associated with that. If, for example, that value is $9 a t-shirt, that means for 25 t-shirts, he has just given how much money? $205. That's an in-kind donation. You have to show that as an income, and you also have to show it as an expense. And why do you show us both? Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to add up. If you show a donation as an in time, you add up all your donations, you add up all your expenditures, and you don't show it as an expense, in kind expense, the numbers aren't going to add, and your bank balance ain't going to be what you actually have of cash on hand. So it is, that's why in kind is showing up in both. The last is the loans. Most of the time, you, I tell candidates, if you pay for anything, you put it down as loans to yourself. Loans to the committee. The reason being is if you've got anything you left, up, left over, you can pay yourself back the loan. If you don't, well, you can always run it up. But do it as a loan. Sometimes, people will loan you money. For you can help you get your campaign started. You only have to start a campaign. Or at the end when you're running all the money and you say, oh, I gotta get this mailer out and I'm 
I'll loan myself, I'll loan you for maybe five hundred dollars and hopefully somebody will come through with a donation and help me pay for it. Otherwise it comes out of my pocket. But always make it as a loan. Is what I always tell recommend the candidates. Next slide. Now there is one exception to the hundred dollar rule. And this, by the way, is one that gives uh, two exceptions actually. One is if you receive a check from a from a political committee. Let's say for an example, the committee to elect uh, The committee to elect Stephanie. Let's say that she goes to a fundraiser for the committee to elect David Phelps. Okay, and she uses a campaign check to give a donation to Mr. Phelps. And the cost of that fundraiser is fifty dollars. That has to be reported. Even though it's under a hundred dollars, a committee to a committee check must be reported. Okay? Now the other exception to the hundred dollar rule is on a husband and wife check. If a husband and wife give a check for $150 to a campaign and both the husband and wife sign the check, then it does not have to be reported. But both signatures have to be on the check. Okay? Otherwise, it's whoever actually signs the check is who the donation is from. Yes? With the, uh, from one committee to another, does it matter if it's cash or check? It does not matter if it's cash or a check is if it's coming from the committee. Okay. Cash is a lot more difficult to come from the committee. But, and checks are easier to verify. If you come to a fundraising dinner as a, and you pay cash, that's considered as an as an individual, not a committee. And that's considered a donation as an individual, not a committee. So those are the two exceptions. Contribution types, checks, money orders. One of the things that I always tell people to do when they get contributions. Checks and layers before you deposit them, Xerox them. That way you've got an accurate record of who gave you money. If you receive cash, then you should fill out a cash receipt, and it's recommended you give a receipt for every cash donation. Okay? That helps you keep track, helps you, if somebody ever questions your reports, you've got the cash receipts. It's greatly improves your chances of, of showing that you've opened, you ran a good campaign. In time, we've talked about. So, now, sometimes someone will donate, and I've seen this happen around, especially around the time here, and you won't immediately get something from them that will be in time. So you ask them for it, and if you don't get it, you have to file it in the next report. Okay? But you should get a in, in nine day loan. We've talked about loans in general. Um, candidates are the ones that make loans to committees. Once in a while, somebody else will, but most of my experience has been the candidates make loans. They agree. Yes. Everybody is limited. And this is why one of the common mistakes that people make is misclassifying donations, okay? And because certain groups, especially unions and corporations are limited on how much they can give, if you misclassify that donation, and I'll give you a comment on this misclassified, people like to put down and show union support on their thing. Most unions do not give you money. The money actually comes from a union PAC, a political action committee. 
If you put down that the local labor union gave you a thousand dollars, another candidate puts down that the local labor union gave him a thousand, and a third candidate puts down that the local labor union gave him five hundred, that local labor union has just violated election law. Because local labor unions are only allowed to give two thousand dollars to any candidate as a labor union, as a political pact, they're unlimited. That's why most of the unions have pacts. Same thing occurs with corporations. I'll give you an example. Lubrifleet. And the owner of Lubrifleet lives here in Puerto County, but he was a big donor of Karen Freeman Wilson's. He was called before the election board of Lake County, had to bring an attorney with him, had to bring all of these records with him because everybody knew that no opinion was the owner of Lubrifly. So they put down that the donation came from Lubrifly. Lubrifly is, uh, is a corporation. He gave, I think it was $7,000 to candidates. The local, the election board over in Lake County was going to charge him $15,000 for excess donations to the local candidates. And the reason was is if a corporation gets more than $2,000 to a local candidate, to local candidates, they can be charged three times the excess donations. And since he had given 7000 the excess was five, three times is 15. So he had to hire a lawyer and go before the board. Just because people had misrepresented where they got the money from. The money came out of his personal account, not his corporate account. So that's where it's really important to keep track and report those things accurately. Next slide. Contributions scheduled at CFA 4A Schedule 4 is five different forms. It's contributions from individuals. And an individual is a person that you name. It is a person that you name. That's what individual means. It doesn't mean a group of individuals. It means an individual by name. Next. Corporations, and we'll get into what is a corporation. Because this is our little tricky one. A law partnership is not a corporation. An LLC is not a corporation. If it says incorporated or company, that's corporation. Next, labor organizations. And these are labor unions only. It is not their PACs. PACs go on their political action committee. By the way, how many of you have campaign committees? Did you form that campaign committee as a PAC? No. Campaign committees are not political action committees. But I don't know how many of you will see an example where, where somebody put down on the political action committee campaign committees that they received donations. And then other organizations. And that's anybody that doesn't fit a bump. So you got to catch up. So let's go to the next one. One of the things I recommend that you put together an Excel spreadsheet. If you've not done it, do it now before Friday. That way when will come Friday, you're ready off. And on the Excel spreadsheet, and I believe that you can use whatever form of the G's, I use Excel. Because it's easy to do a lot of serving and stuff like that. Here is an example of one. It's the date deposited. The amount, was it by cash, check, or money work? Or what was it from? Who's it from? Street address, city, state, and zip, occupation. If somebody gives you over a thousand dollars as an individual, you have to put down what their occupation is. 
that's probably requirements when we go through boxes. And then the last one, was it a direct, indirect, or loan to the committee? This is giving all the information put on a form that makes it easier to when you go to fill out the CFA forms. And then what type of donation was it? An individual, corporation, act, union, or other? This is a very useful tool. We recommend that you put together spreadsheets like this. Next slide. Contributions by individuals, which we said is an individual. The first block must contain the complete name and address. By the way, that's something that a lot of people leave out is the addresses. I know it's a real pain in the butt to find the addresses sometimes, especially if it hasn't been done by check. But try to find the address. The other one, where it becomes a pain in the butt is if you buy something online, you can find generally the town is, and state pretty good, but sometimes it's difficult to find the street address. You could be forgiven for some of those, but try to get as many complete name and addresses. Next, that's the better line says contributions, uh, the red one says contribution of. Uh, occupation of the person. Kind of contributes occupation. That's if somebody gives you over a thousand dollars, where do you have to put that? What is their occupation? Architect, lawyer, businessman, business owner, what? Then you have type of contribution. If it's direct, which most contributions are direct, you check that box. Indirect, you check the box and you say what it was for. I talked about the t-shirts. That would be indirect, and in the green spot, you would fill out t-shirt donation. Okay, so that's where you put down what that actual donation was. Food for the fundraiser. Uh, postage for a mail. Whatever it is that somebody gave you to indirectly pay for that you did not run through your books. Number four is the group is if the candidate makes a loan, it should show as a loan. Then you list the amount of money for this period, and if you made a loan in the first period, and you make another loan in the second period, you list you add up here today. And who the date received and who received it? Who receives the money? Who? Yes and no. <laughs> Typically, it is the treasurer's signature there, and why is it the treasurer's signature? If the person that received it is a person who deposited it in the bank, and that's generally the treasurer, it could be the candidate if the candidate is its own treasurer. Remember, you don't receive it until you deposit it. So therefore, the person making the deposit is the person receiving it, because that's the person making the authorization to receive it, and that generally is the treasurer. And then you total the bottom of the page, each individual page, and on the last page of the report, you're going to put a total for the entire income. Next slide. Contributions for corporations are filled out the same way. Here is where I point out that LLCs and LLPs, law firms, are not corporations. If it does say PC, if the lawyer and master it says PC, that's a professional corporation. Therefore, they would call them corporations. But an LLP, if it says but Blackie Gabriel Bosick and Harpin LLP, then it doesn't go on this form because it's not a corporation. They're a partnership. And partnerships are not considered a corporation for Indiana. Uh, 
Fuck campaign finance. LLCs are limited liability companies. But therefore, Indiana finance law, they're not considered a corporation. Now, you get a check and it doesn't tell you whether they're, what they are. You can go to the Indiana Secretary of State's website, do a business search, and on that business search, it will tell you whether they're an LLP, LLC, or a corporation. On the Indiana Secretary of State's website. Okay? Any questions on corporations? Next slide. Contribution by labor organizations. Again, you've got to look at the check and make sure if it says PAC or Political Education Committee or Political Action League, League or something like that, is there something after that union name? Three little letters or generally three or four little letters. That's a PAC, not the actual union. Most unions are, will give you what is called PAC money and not union money. It should not go under labor union. It should go under political PACs. Okay? Any, any, again, when you put it under labor unions, you just maybe put that labor union in a trick bag. And guess what? What their opinion did? He cut back on some of his donations because people got into trouble. And you don't want to get your donors in trouble. Because you want to keep those donations coming for future years. If you plan to run again or keep running. Next. Contribution by all political action committees. Again, this is PAC. Here is some examples of local firefighters, PAC, Family Express, PAC. Uh, the biggest mistake here is local candidate committees are not PACs. There's very few ever that have formed a PAC. The Porter County Republican Party, the Porter County Democrat Party, the state Republican Party, the state Democrat Party are not PACs. If it is a PAC, it'll say PAC on it. PAC with Political Action Committee. And that's got to go on this form. I know PACs get bad names, and everybody says PACs are bad. But that's the way life is, and that's why you better report it that way. Next slide, please. <coughs> now, if you got a check and it ain't fit the first three, First four, guess what? It goes on your last CFA uh, four is eight on other organizations. Here's where you put the LLPs, LLCs, political committees, uh, party committees, and anything that doesn't apply. And those are generally the ones that don't uh, that end up there. Okay? Any questions on that? Next slide. Expenses. Copy every, again, put together an Excel spreadsheet that has the check number that you wrote, the date you wrote the check, who you wrote the check to, the address, the amount of the check, and the purpose of the check. Because I guarantee you, one thing that I'm going to show you today is people forget to fill out the purpose of why you wrote a check to somebody. And you've got to fill out the purpose of every expenditure that you have, that you list. Okay, why did you why did you go to active science? Well, I happen to know who probably anybody involved in politics knows. But if somebody in the general pick up public picks up your finance report. It says, exercise, well, I wonder what they do. Well, everybody knows they do yard signs, and why do I have to put down their pay for yard signs? Why do you have to put down that you pay for the yard signs? Because somebody may not know what exercise do. 
I use that one as an exaggeration because I think most people know what active science is. But let's say you bought something from on Amazon from some company out in Pennsylvania. Okay? I don't know that they make yard signs. I don't know that that's what you got from them. You have to put down what you actually ordered from that company. You ordered flyers. You ordered stickers. You ordered pins. Whatever it is, you've got to put the purpose down. And then the type, it was a direct, indirect, or one repayment. What, what was the purpose of that uh, type of expense? Next slide. How many of you have paid campaign staff? Anybody? Or paid campaign volunteers? They're very common in mayoral races and above. Very common in state rep races and like that. Commissioner races. If you do, you need to get, if you pay anybody over $600 a year, an individual or, uh, you must have them fill out a W-9 so that you can send them a 1099 at the end of the year. That has to be reported if it's over $600. Next slide. Or are you getting trouble with the IRS? Some of the bigger campaigns I work with use what's called expense receipts. If somebody, for an example, goes out and wants to buy something for the campaign, if they want a reimbursement for that, they have to turn it in an expense receipt. This helps you keep up with your record. Keeping. Again, most of the time, that's the larger campaigns use those. Next slide. If you have campaign workers, keep track of the workers. I'll tell you one of the things in working over in uh, 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 Lake County with a lot of the campaigns over there is they make people, people to stand at the polls election day. Over here we get volunteers. Over there they pay a lot of the time. It's a little difference between the two counties, folks. Well, if you do, and you have people work for you, have them put out these sheets so that you can keep track of who you who you pay and how much you pay. Okay? Next slide. Itemized expenditures. You again you have to have a full name and mailing address. Here's a here the next column. It says recipients, occupation, and office sub. Well, here's one where I'm going to show you that they put down active signs. What's active signs for occupation? Their active signs occupation is a sign company. Well, you still got to put it down. Still got to fill it up. Another example. I made a check donation to the election, election to elect Donna Perdue for commissioner. Well, who's the recipient? Committee to elect Donna Perdue. What's the recipient's office that they're running for? County Commissioner in Porter County. That wasn't filled out on the form. It has to be filled out. Every one of these blocks are up there for a reason and should have something in it. Okay? I know it seems intuitive to people that get involved in campaign. A lot of these things are well known by everybody. But again, you're writing it for the general public. And for the newspapers, I tell you, I guarantee you, on the 18th of October, I'm going to be receiving a phone call from, from the newspapers asking me about campaign finance reports. I guarantee it. I receive it every year. And if you can walk me through this again, it's been six months since I did it last time. So I'll walk them through the reports again. And so that information is very important. Again, what did you, what kind of a uh, type of uh, expenditure was it? Direct in-kind payment of debt, uh, return contributions. Here's, an, here's another one that I haven't talked about yet. 
And I'll, I'll use it as an example. E.G. Marshall made a contribution to a candidate and wrote a check for $2,500. Okay, E.G. Marshall is a corporation. The check was deposited. They just paid $500 too much money to that candidate. So the candidate wrote a check for $500 back to E.G. Marshall to return the excess contribution. So now the candidate does not have to do that, by the way. If somebody pays you too much money, you don't have to pay them back by state law. But if you want future contributions from that company, you're best doing it. You don't have to do it. But you're better off than all of them doing it. And that's where you would show that as an expenditure. Because you showed the $2,500 as a receipt, now you've got to show the $500 that you gave them back that was access. And then this is where the purpose is. Why did you spend that money? Okay, you want to exercise? Well, I wanted yard signs. So you've got to put yard signs in that little pink box. And that little pink box is one of the boxes that most of you forget to fill up. Then the, the amount you spent this period, the amount you spent year to date, and what date did you write that check to? Okay? What is the date in which you bought that stuff? Or wrote the check to? And then again, the bottom of the page you told it, and on the very last page you told all the page. Yes. That's that's fine when you show this debit card. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, debit's the same way as a check. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're running a real small campaign. Oh yeah. <laughs> Deliberately. <laughs> Good. Good. Next one. One of the other ones that this gets interpreted is one of these codes. It's either a contribution, fundraising, advertising, or operational. And those are various the definitions. Now, one of the most misunderstood ones is you're going to do a fundraiser and you send out invitations. So you get invitations printed up. What is the printing of the invitation considered? Correct. When you print the invitation, the printing of the invitation is considered advertising. Because you're sending it to people that probably ain't going to show up at your fundraiser. You may be sending it to 4,000 people and you'd be like, you get 100. So by you're putting your name in front of them, it's considered advertising. Postage, what is that considered? It's operational. All postage is considered operational. And then if you're actually the food, the catering hall, the decorations and all that, that's fundraising. But I don't know how many people will send invitations out to a fundraiser and list that as code F, where it should be a code A. As long as you list it, that's a minor little thing, but since you've been here, you know not to do that. <laughs> but that's probably the one that's probably the most difficult one of that. I think the rest of them are pretty self explanatory. If you have any questions, you, know, you can read this page again and blow it up where you can read it better. Next slide. If you've loaned your committee money or somebody has, this is where you fill out the form for that. It's pretty self-explanatory. I color coded it for you, so that it makes it easier. Next slide. CFA Evans. This is if you get a thousand dollars from somebody during a certain time period. When do you have to fill out the CFA Evans? No. No, yes or no? And you're right. No. CFA 11. If you get a thousand dollars on October 10th, 
you do not have to fill out a CA to pay your loan. If you get $1,000 or more from one group or individual on October 12th, you have to. It's only between October 12th and 48 hours before the election do you have to file the CFA loan. And it has to be filed within 48 hours of receipt of that money. Okay? I've had people and seen people turn in, they got about $1,000 in June from somebody, and they'll turn in the CFA loan. Didn't need to. Because it's in the time period of a regular report, you do not have to. It's only the, from the close date of the pre-election or pre-primary report and the primary election date or the fall election date that you have to fill out the CFA and other. For many thousand dollars or more from one individual corporation or bank. Okay? It's what's called a surprise report. So that you don't surprise your opponent by getting a whole bunch of money in after the filing period that he's not aware or she's not aware that you've got, that you're going to spring mysterious ads, mysterious mailers. What do they get all that money? They didn't have that money to begin with. All of a sudden they're spending $50,000. And they only had $10,000 on hand. Where did they get that other $40,000? That's the purpose of this report. That's why that report was handed in. And I'll go to show you what what you've got to fill out is very similar to the others that you fill out. Next slide. And then the last thing is the candidate and treasurer sign it, turn it in by what time on the 18th? Noon. Noon what time? Central Daylight Day Savings Time. Noon is the county time here, not noon in Indianapolis. Unless you're a state person and you got filed by New Indianapolis time. Okay? Next slide. Which should be the last one. I have one question. Yeah, question. So can you go over how to report online donations? Because I know that people are doing that. Just so happens I have a thing on there. I'm four years old. This is an example of using the wrong form. Why do we both, all, everybody use, uses some form of political donations. Antidote is used by a lot of the Republicans. Act Blue is used by a lot of Democrats. Act Blue is not a political action committee. Act Blue is a credit clearing house. Helps you accept donations online. If you get donations online through your website or however you take it through Square or whatever, it has to be reported just the same as any other donations. Ask Blue sends a report out that tells you who the donation comes from, their name and address. And you must use that information on the report. Do not put down the last who gave you money because that blue did not. Somebody made a donation through that blue to your campaign. And it should be shown as that. This, by the way, was one from the primary. That somebody told out that that blue had made all these donations to that candidate. And that blue had never made a donation in their life to that candidate. They made donations to individuals. Through that, individuals may spend 
the nation's true man. Okay, so that's how you report. You've got to report them the same. And you will get a report, I know. Because I got the reports. Remember I told you I was carrying through the Wilson's treasure? She received a lot of money through ACTU, so I know exactly what they do. I, I, I work with a lot of Republicans, I know exactly what Square does, I know what ACT and does. All of them give you the information you need. Use that information, not your credit clearinghouse. Okay, the other thing, on online donations, if somebody donates you $250, you got to put on $250. Then what else wants you to put down? Yeah, you got to put on $250. Yeah, you got to put on $250. Did you actually get $250 in your bank? No, there's an expense associated with that. So you actually got to have an expense associated with that. And that expense goes to that group as a credit card clearing for credit card processing. Yeah. Those expenses have to be itemized, or can they be all one expense? It can be all one expense until it reaches the. It can be unitemized until it goes over $100, and it has to be itemized, and you can list several of them in one box. You use your bank statement to, to uh, aggregate all that? You can use your bank statement to aggregate it. That's how I find out when it actually is charged. But by the way, the date you received it is not the date you make the donation, it's the date it's actually received into the bank. Again, and, and there, there's a reason for this dating event. And that is if somebody starts questioning your reports, the first thing the election board is going to do, if they think it's a valid complaint, is they're going to subpoena your bank records. And then start comparing your bank records to your finance reports and looking for matching up the finance bank records to the campaign finance reports. That's why those bank record dates are so important. Go ahead, throw up another one, folks. Yeah. And if you notice, I've done say 219. So that was a primary report. Here's an example of what I talked about, somebody putting on a labor union. It's the Iron Workers Local, made a donation, and it's a PAL. That PAL tells you, P PAL, PAC tells you it's a It should have been under CFA 4, not CFA, or Schedule A4 instead of Schedule A3. Because it's not a union, it's the union pact that made it. This is another one where we put it on the political action committees. I talked about this particular candidate made a donation to Dead uh, Porter, Dave Reynolds, and Southern Township Democrats, they sh that form should have been under Schedule A5, not A4. Because those are not PACs. Those are campaign committees and central committees. So we gave the wrong form to use. At least they reported it. I'll give them that. This one was 2015. This is the one that's totally illegal. This candidate, you are not to use campaign funds for personal use. This personal, this campaign candidate loaned himself money. That is totally illegal. You cannot loan yourself money out of your campaign. You can use campaign funds to buy stuff for your events and like that, but you cannot loan yourself money. What even, what even compounds this worse, if you notice the day in which the loans were made, 
They were made early in the year. The loans were not paid out until the end of the year. That meant he was using that money throughout the year for personal use. And there's a uh, state uh, a congressman over in Illinois that went to jail for seven years, and his wife did too. Okay? For using campaign funds to buy stuff for their personal use. So that's a definite no no. Don't do that. Okay, here's one from the primary again. This particular candidate, which I blacked out, because I don't want to embarrass any individual candidate, that's why I blacked it out, made loans to, to, to the committee, okay, during the primary. But on the first page in the CFA 4, where the red circle is, over on the left side of that sheet, there's a line called low debts owned by the committee. And there's no number in there. Well, if you loan the committee money, that means the, com the committee owes you money. There ought to be a debt owed on that line. And there is none. So if you owe yourself money, you've got to show it as a, 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 on that line. And also you have to fill out debts owed by the committee. Next one. Yeah, go to scroll down a little bit on that Here's 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 another one candidate from uh, 2018. Cash on hand. On the front page, there's a column called, the bottom line says, cash on hand, this period in year to date. Guess what? Those numbers should match exactly. And if you were notice of the example up here, that number's off by $2,000. How can you have two different numbers for your current cash on hand? You can't. That means you made an error someplace in the report. You need to go back and look at that report and find that error. Okay. And I guarantee you, if you do this over in Lake County, your lucky Porter County hasn't got on to this yet. But it's according to you. Because I know you got a good clerk. It's, and an election board is going to start taking notice of this. They'll send you the report back and ask you to correct it. They'll actually reject your report and tell you to correct it. If you have 10 days to correct it, you're going to be fine. $10 a day for up to $100 for a defective report. Doing better than that. Oh, yeah, there's, there's an expense one there. It shows all the missing information. Okay, here. Yeah, this one here. I talked about missing information. This one's missing incomplete addresses, no recipient occupations, no candidate information, even though it was a candidate paid for, and the purposes are not shown. Why did they make the donations? So there's a whole bunch of missing information, and there's no total at the bottom of the page. So those are some of the IVs, by the way, every one of these reports came from Porter County. Our reports that some of, some of you may have filed. I don't recognize anybody's reports that are used to hear by me. And I just pick these randomly. It's easy to go through the reports and find. But I will also say this. 
training hasn't been offered in the past that way, so there's been reasons why. Okay, that's pretty much my presentation in case anybody has any questions. Um, I just wanted to make sure I got this right. So if one Maybe it's attending a, the event for another one. You said that's a donation, not a contribution. That that's right? a donation or contribution. It's oh, donation is a contribution. You have to report it regardless of the amount of money. So if tickets are sold to a big event for more than one uh, candidate, how do they report that? They should have never had it that way to begin with. The state recommends candidates do not hold trade fundraisers. And the reason is, how do you report the income and expense? What the state recommends you do is you file, file a political action committee, run the money through a political action committee, pay all the expenses out of the political action committee, and then divide the money back up to the candidates. Equally. The problem you run into is how much of the expenses should come from candidate A, candidate B, candidate C, uh, that is each campaign, you've got to build to a restaurant. And I know where you're holding it, Don Kiyotis. You've got to build to Don Kiyotis. Well, how much of it should the committee for Robert Cotton make? How much of it should the committee for uh, 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 Bill Gardell pay of it? How much should the committee for uh, Liz Walker pay for? How much should each of the committees pay for? You've got to run it through a central committee. The best way to do that in that case is run it through the, the Valparaiso Democratic Party Committee. Have all the checks written to the Valparaiso Democratic Party, and then have the Democratic Party pay the bills, and then they buy the money out to the candidates later on. That's the way I. I swear, I, I would run it as a Republican. Yeah. And that's what the state recommends, by the way, is passed. If you want to check, check your campaign finance report, work each in there that way. Could you kind of just explain the timeline of uh, the report gets submitted during your whole uh, time while you're in office, or just the year you run? You must submit a campaign report pre-primary, pre-election, and annual in the year that you run. In the years you do not run, you must file an annual report, as long as you keep your committee open. A lot of people will just stay in their committee and then reform it again when they run four years later. Some people will keep their committees open year to year, and if you keep your committee open year to year, you must file every year. And the annual report once a year. And when is that due? That's due in January of each year. The date changes, so I can't tell you the specific date. So her question leads me to ask another question. So if you disband your committee, what happens with those funds if there are some remaining? You cannot disband the committee with any funds or any debt. So, if you owe money, you cannot disband the committee. Unless whoever you owe the money to writes out the loan with the other. If you have money left over in your committee, you can make a donation to a 501c3, any charitable organization, to any political, other political committee, or any other political campaign. Your access funds for you. Yeah. So when you disband, can you do that at any time? Just file a form. Can you disband at any time? You can disband a political committee at any time you want to after the, the general election in which you were, you were either successful or failed. Okay. What if you have no expenses? You still have to file a report. Okay. But the report is due on the 18th, and you're going to have expenses. 
after that. Correct? You could have expenses after that. That's correct. What if you're paying for those expenses yourself, taking no kind of You still have to report it if you receive over $100, if you pay out of your own pocket $100. And the office pays so much money, and that depends on the particular office. You're right, from town council to town. Okay, now you said you can loan your committee money to start up. Yes, you can loan your committee money. Well, if you have money left over, you can repay the loan to yourself. Yeah, you can repay the loan to yourself. For example, it's lots of campaign. You loan yourself a thousand dollars. You got five hundred dollars left over. You can pay that, use that five hundred dollars to pay back your loan, five hundred of your loan, and then write a letter for giving the other five hundred. Just to make sure I get this right, you can individuals can give you there's no limit. Individuals are obligated to how much they can give you. I, I can tell you right now, in, in one particular race, an individual is given $10,000 to a campaign that the person was. They went to high school together, they've been friends for years, her husband is a very successful hockey coach, and she just wants to do everything to help him out, so she's given him $10,000 as an individual. So you have somebody like I do who gives you just different things. Okay, that's a t-shirt that you donated. Okay. That's an in-kind contribution. She, she purchased something. You know, that's an in-kind contribution. That's in-kind. And yes. she has receipt for that, but she doesn't have receipt for the shirt. Then you have to go to the fair market value on them. T-shirts. I'd recommend nine dollars. Seven to nine dollars per T-shirt is pretty standard. Fair market value for printed T-shirts. Any other questions? I well, I'm getting into her time, so I don't want to. Uh, and I'll stay around and answer questions after. Quite yet, but can I put this on the stand? I don't know if I want to go around with it. that comes from the Secretary of State about some things that I'm going to talk about. So. This is going to be pretty brief. Um, so, I think a lot of us know about yard signs. So my name is Sarah Ferraro, and I live in Lake County, I reside there, but I've worked on several campaigns here in Porter County, um, worked on four statewide campaigns for our state, and was over 12 candidates in two different states in the Midwest. So, um, Ms. Donna?
So hopefully you just heard that I introduced myself. I live in Lake County, but I'm proud to be here today. I'm so glad you guys are having a training. It's really important to learn not only from your, your elections office here in Porter County, but from each other. So um, I'm hoping after what I say that you can um, learn from somebody here or share an idea. Um, glad, glad everybody came today. So, um, yard signs, yay, fun. <laughs> not one of my most um, fun things to actually talk about, but when Jessica said this is what we'd like you to talk about, of course. So, um, there's some different things that come with the pleasure to host yard signs and have them as a candidate, so I'm going to talk about that today. But um, everything is in your pamphlet right here. So. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So these are some things that I'm going to make sure to cover today, so I made a little, not really agenda, but um, just want to make sure to let you know what we're going to talk about. So um, there's some state regulations and then um, some municipality, like our local area where we live, but best practices. Um, and then I'm going to talk about um, something that I care most about, how to manage your signs, just some tips and tricks, um, and um, most of you might have some other things that you want to share, and then hopefully we'll have some time if, if there's questions, uh, then you can ask. I don't know everything, but I'm glad that Justice here, Mr. Taylor, he might have some other things too. Um, there are a lot of other state codes and things that I'm not going to have time to come up, go over, so if you have a question outside of this area, please ask. Um, okay. So, <coughs> this is kind of a new one. The, um, did everybody know that the state changed the law in, in July of 2018? Um, yard time can now go up 60 days prior to the election day. And they have to be taken down six days after. So the state regulations are going to supersede anything that your municipality has. You might have ordinances or different things, um, but I'm going to talk about that in the next slide in just a second. I do want to mention, like I said, this is all in this fun brochure here. Um, there are penalties for, um, well, let me just go over. So the time frame is that. Um, disclaimers. The disclaimer needs to be on actually everything that you print unless it's a pen, um, a button, or some, something super tiny, or a shirt, um, you should have a disclaimer on all of your political um, materials, and including signs. So that would be um, your, can your name of your committee, and it's going to say, sorry, where's my one that I highlighted? And they have exactly in here the size the smallest size it can be, at least seven point font. Um, I know everybody here can, can read this themselves, but I just want to be clear that these are exact guidelines from the Secretary of State that we should all follow. Um, and it should be clear, um, you know, an opposite color from the background color of your sign or whatever material that you're printing. Um, and then they have examples here. Um, I'm not going to go over the federal regulations because I don't think anyone in here is running for Congress. But if you are, there's different regulations from the FEC that you need to kind of read over for disclaimers about those things. So, um, yeah. But if you don't have those things, like I said, most important to know there are penalties, so fines, um, that can happen if you don't follow the rules. Um, and then permission just means do we have permission to put the sign in that place? And I'm going to talk about some of those things in the next slide, too, and placement in different locations. So, um, like I said, it's very well defined in here, but sometimes we get confused about what our city and town is saying and what um, we actually should be following uh, needs to be on the sign legally. So, um, Okay, I think we're ready for this one, yeah. So your municipality, where you live, your city or town, always check with them to make sure that, this is mostly regarding the placement of the sign. So 
So we don't place signs in. Um, you may see candidates do this or different organizations. Um, not in the, the parkway, that's that little grassy area that's between the sidewalk and the road. Um, it needs to be in the person's, you know, property that they they have. Um, but check check with your municipality. I do have some something that I picked up from Portage and then one from Valpo. It's just a, a flyer about like their guidelines for placement of signs. It's nothing about um, how many signs you can have, but they just have some guidance on where to place your signs. Especially if it's a larger sign, we want to make sure that people can see when they're pulling out of their driveways and things are safe <coughs> for their community. Um, so, and there's no limit now that the state law supersedes, there's no limit on the number of signs that you can have in the yard or the size from your local municipality. And if I'm saying something that's incorrect, that you've heard, please let me know. Check the, with several the, the, state, the state does limit size to four by eight. Yes. So I think it's 32 square feet. Right, right. So that that is limited, 32 square feet. But um, like I said, different municipalities, this is just reported, just, they just have some guidance on good placement of where they prefer them to be or not to be. Um, so that there's clear vision for drivers. I have one here from Valvo too. So that's why it's just good to check. Um, um, oh, the brochure stated a couple of things about not placing them on utility poles or public property. You do need to get permission. Um, And then, like I said, this is going to be pretty quick. So, um, I just want to say one quick thing that I didn't have a slide for, but just about the actual design of your signs. So, I know a lot of folks in here are either currently running or you probably already have your sign designs and maybe they're, hopefully they're in yards or about to be. Um, I suggest not overly busy while you have the signs so that people get to know who you are and what your name is, so that when you see it on the ballot, they remember. So um, it's a big cost for you as a candidate and as a campaign to buy these things that are going to be placed places, so you want them to be um, somewhere visible or in yards that people have already given you permission, not somewhere where someone's going to say, what's that, and then throw that $6, <laughs> $6 or $7 thing in the garbage. So um, simple design, name, Visibility, colors that are visible and not overly busy um, so that people can see and get to know who you are. Um, let's see. Well, those are just some tips. I would suggest, so this, the reason I created this slide, how many people have heard the slogan, sign no vote? It's true, right, Mr. Taylor? <laughs> right, that's tough. Sign, the only purpose of signs is to make your volunteers feel good. <laughs> <laughs> and he's right, feel good. So people have pride in their candidates that they're going to support. Yeah, it's something for volunteers to do. But really those signs, like I like to say, they don't, they don't grow legs and walk to the pool. So, um, I just wanted to share a couple quick um, tips about how to use your signs properly, not only to make sure the design of your sign is simple and that your name is out there in the community, but we have this expensive thing that we've purchased. Are you managing your list properly? Does your, your list, are you collecting phone numbers from people so that you can make sure to, and addresses so that you can thank them with a postcard or call them and make sure that they voted um, there's just different ways, things that you can do when you're organized with your list and with these tools or give, give this job to someone else because you as candidate, just like Mr. Taylor said, shouldn't be the treasurer. I don't think that you should be managing your signs as well because you have other family members or someone else that, that would love to have this task because they <laughs> maybe don't want to do some other things. Have them help you 
um, not only manage your signs, but what I call kind of babysit your signs. So if there's ones that break or need some TLC, need <laughs> fixing, um, you can send someone else out so that you can do other more important things. Um, let's see, just some other tips that I can think of. Like I said, just being very organized with your list, you can do a lot with that um, and take you some other places rather than just having things that are going to disappear. Um, but we should be good stewards of our community and pick the signs up. Yes, the state says six days, but I even work on campaigns that night of we're picking picking these signs up because um, I've just seen that not in some some communities the, the year after, and that's <laughs> you know not only does it cause confusion, it just shows that somebody didn't care enough to send their team around and clean up. Um, so. By the way, it's both winners and losers have had their signs. Right. So um, we just need to be, <laughs> you know, cognizant of how this is representing ourselves and representing our community. Um, so yes, you're probably going to want to have enough signs that you have signs at every polling place. If you're a citywide candidate or if you're thinking of running statewide, obviously that's even bigger of a deal. Um, Is 
So yeah, think of tips and or things that you can do with your signs rather than just have them just utilize that as a tool to actually take you to the next step. Um, just the last slide is if there's any questions among the group or ideas, um, I just want to encourage you to get further help from either a current or former candidate or if you're working on a team or with a political party um, or, you know, obviously here in the election office they can answer anything. They go to trainings and bring further help back here to the county. But, um, you know, find someone that you can ask some of these questions, especially what Mr. Taylor talked about. That is extremely important that we know about campaign finance and that we're asking someone if we're not sure. Um, this is my contact information. I actually run a nonprofit in Lake County that does um, civic engagement training. So you can find us on Facebook, um, Rise Northwest Indiana, and we do a lot of cool stuff. So check us out. Um, I think that's about it. I know I didn't really talk about just to also mention people had questions about the when you need to have the four and elect on your sign. But if that wasn't in this brochure per, per se. I don't know if there's actually like a state code or if that's a party thing. Yeah, that that is that has been challenged and I challenged it. And the state has done away with the need to have four or elect on the sign, except it is very misrepresentational. And I think they're going to try to come up with some wording in the future, but it's if you if you're not in the office, you ought to put down four or one. If you're not the current office holder, it's just good practice. And by the way, do not make your signs like I like to call artsy fartsy. <laughs> you're not creating. Now form for somebody's yard. Yes. It needs three days, three things. Vote for your name and the office. That's it. All the rest of it's wasted space. Remember, people are going 30 miles an hour past these signs. What do you want them to know? Your name and your office. By federal law, you get into federal regulations if you put the date of the election on your sign. And there is some real, if you want to really get into some real stuff, start getting into federal law. I highly recommend you don't put the date on the signs. First of all, if you're running in a primary, the signs you've got to change for the fall. Use your other literature to change the put data. Yard signs, again, you're adding extra words that people can't read. What if the sign just says vote November 5th? Even if it's as long as it does not advocate a particular party, right. that it's then no, it's okay. okay. It's, uh, but it has to have who paid for that sign. Authorized to pay for buy. That's a disclaimer. It's a lot of all the time. Pay for by committee to elect. And on all your materials. So I just put it on everything I make, honestly, for campaigns. I mean, it has pens and stuff are too small, but even papers that we print at our campaign office, you know, or if you're a, as if a team of volunteers does something and pays for it out of their pocket. Just like Mr. Taylor talked about, it needs to say, you know, paid for by volunteers, something like that, because that's going to be it's not authorized by the right. committee. Right, right, going to be on your reporting. Hopefully, as an in-kind donation, <coughs> and those things need to people watch that. So just, you know, have this flavor or something. <laughs> for coming to our first candidate information session. If you did not sign in, please sign in. Um, it'll help us to kind of figure out if we're going to continue it or whatever. More names about our book. And you are? Jeff Cavalian, Fort County Clerk. Thank you. Um,
And again, as a disclaimer, this is all information. It's not in any way to replace the state code or the information. If you have questions, go see your attorney, your party chairman, report back to the candidate, um, materials that come out from the state. Um, a lot of that you can get from our website, but it's not you can go to the state website and there's tons of other information that you can download. And by the way, there is one thing I forgot to fail, to fail to say. If you do not file your report by noon on the 18th, you can be fined $50 a day for every day that you're late. And if you file it on Monday, you are now three days late. That's a $150 fine. They can fine you $50 a day up to a $1,000 or $2,000. What if I'm spending less than $100? If you're spending less than $100, then you do not have to file. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And again, if you just sign in, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are extra